Now, I've already read for you the text that, that we were going to be looking at this morning primarily, but I do want to read at least from John chapter 18 where it fits in, in the text, or at least the gospel we have been going through. So let me just simply read John 18 verses 1 and 2. And when we get to those passages I'll be making reference to from Luke's gospel, I'll simply read those verses again. John writes, when Jesus had spoken these words, and again, these are the words of his high priestly prayer, he went forth with his disciples over the ravine of the Kidron, where there was a garden in which he entered with his disciples. Now Judas also, who was betraying him, knew the place, for Jesus had often met there with his disciples. May God bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now, remember back in John chapter 18 or 17, when Jesus was praying his high priestly prayer, that in that prayer, he expressed something. It wasn't a petition, but rather he said something that he was doing for himself in order that he might benefit his disciples. And what he was doing was sanctifying himself for our sakes so that we might be sanctified in the truth. Now, remember what Jesus was saying there was not that he needed to be purified from sin because he is and he ever will be that spotless and blameless Lamb of God. But what he said he was doing was setting himself apart to complete that task, that work that his Father had given him, that he was placing his eyes on the cross and he was not going to allow anything to get in his way of making that sacrifice on the cross. He wouldn't allow anything to turn him aside so that he might save us, so that he might grant to us his spirit who would be able to make the word of God powerful in our lives, not only to save us, but also to make us like him. Well, in our text uh, this morning, we see the greatest example of that sanctification as Jesus faces what is perhaps his greatest temptation, and that is to avoid the cross to save his life. Now, that's what we need to see is actually going on here. Now, as I mentioned before, it's interesting that John does not record this temptation as the other gospel writers do, all of them do. Uh, up to this point, I resisted going through what all the gospels say, as I've already told you, because I don't want to create a harmony of the Gospels, and none of the Gospel writers actually create a harmony of the Gospels. They all have their message. They all put the elements of Jesus' life in the place where they put it for a reason and a purpose. There is a message they're trying to communicate, and we want to get that message. But So that's why I've been sticking just with John's message. But I thought it was important to see what happened to Jesus as He was praying in the garden. If we are to understand the extent, I should say, the, the height, the depth, the, the, the breadth of the love that our Lord actually has for His Father and for us, how much He loved us. So this morning, we're going to take a bit of a detour into another gospel. We're going to look at Luke's gospel, as I've already told you. And take a look at this important event. And what I want us to look at are basically three things. I want us to see the place of Jesus and His disciples' prayer. And by the way, I want you to notice we're not looking just at Jesus' prayer here. We're looking also at the prayer of His disciples because Jesus went into the garden, He told them to pray, and then He went a stone's throw away and He prayed. So what we want to do is look at their prayers and the outcome of their particular prayers. You basically, to see you get out of it what you put into it in a certain, uh, to a certain degree. So we want to see the place of their prayer, we want to see the content of their prayer, and we want to see the results of their prayer, or we should say prayers. So first of all, let's consider the place of their prayers. After Jesus had finished praying for Himself and His disciples, John tells us they went to a garden that they might pray some more, that they might seek the Father for His strength. Uh, John writes in John chapter 18, verse 1, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the ravine of the Kidron where there was a garden 
in which he entered with his disciples. Now we know from all the gospel accounts that this garden was situated at the foot of the Mount of Olives, which is just east of Jerusalem. Perhaps if we had time, we could uh, see a little bit of the imagery that's involved here. You know, when Israel and Judah were taken captivity, they were taken east into uh, Assyria, into Babylon. When Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden, out of the place of God's blessing, they, they went out east of Eden. Going east is always a sign of curse. And here, the garden is east of Jerusalem, and perhaps we have something here of the imagery of what our Lord Jesus Christ was about to undergo, taking the curse of God upon Himself so that we would not be cursed by our own sins because our sins brought that curse on us. Now, this garden was called Gethsemane, which means the oil press because the garden was full of olive trees. And again, I was trying to find out if we knew exactly where that garden was, but I guess there's like four places where they think that this garden once existed, and not surprisingly, there's a church built up around uh, each one of them, and di from differing Christian denominations, or perhaps non-Christian, or at least historically Christian denominations, saying here, here, and here, it doesn't really matter. What matters is Jesus came there. Now, Luke tells us that it was the place that Jesus would often come for the very purpose of prayer, at least when He was around Jerusalem or uh, in Jerusalem. I think when he was around Jerusalem, he would usually stay at Bethany, at the homes of those whom he knew. Uh, Luke writes this in Luke 22, verse 39, and he came out and proceeded, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples also followed him. Notice again, this was his custom, and that's why Judas would also know where to find Jesus in order that he might betray him. John writes in John 18, verse 2, Now Judas also, who was betraying him, knew the place, for Jesus had often met there with his disciples. Now, I just want to draw our attention to this garden for this, just this one point, and then we'll move on to the next. The first is, again, the idea of curse. Jesus was going into the garden because He was preparing to become a curse for us. The Bible says, if we have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, He took our curse upon Himself and He did it in this garden. But secondly, I want you to notice, again, the imagery of a garden here. Where is it that we, as human beings, lost our lives? We lost it in the garden. We lost it in the Garden of Eden when our first father, Adam, failed to overcome the enemy of our souls gave in to the temptation, ate the fruit, disobeying God, and brought the curse upon himself and upon all of his children. Well, just as our life was lost in the garden, so our life was gained in the garden when the Son of Man gave himself over to the enemy in order to pay for the consequences of our sins. In this case, Jesus doesn't repel the enemy but basically gives himself over to him in order that he might die, in order that he might take the curse so that we might be saved. Jesus is the second Adam, so look at the imagery here of the garden. Now let's look second at the content of their prayers, and again I just want you to note quickly here that Jesus wasn't the only one who was praying in the garden. He had also told his disciples to pray. We read in Luke 22, verse 40, when he arrived at the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. Now, we recognize that Jesus was about to face the greatest temptation of his life, but you realize the disciples were about to be tempted as well. Remember, Jesus had told Peter at the Last Supper, Peter, Satan has desired to sift you like wheat but I have prayed for you, which means that Satan wanted to tempt him. And when Jesus said, I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, and when you've turned again, strengthen your brethren. Jesus was saying, Satan is going to tempt you. You're going to fall into that temptation, but I have prayed for you. You're not going to fall away. And when you repent, I want you to begin to minister to your brethren. Well, you see, Jesus was not the only one who was about to be tempted. The disciples were as well, and so Jesus told them they should pray. When the soldiers would arrive in the garden... They were going to be tempted to abandon 
Jesus. When he was arrested, they were going to be tempted to deny Jesus. After he was crucified, they were going to be tempted to leave off the work and hide for their lives where they were so that they too would not die. And so Jesus says, pray that you enter not into temptation. Now, how they prayed and what the result was of their prayer we'll return to in a minute when we look at the results of their prayers. But Jesus also came to the garden to pray, and this is what I want us to see mainly. We read in Luke 22, verses 41 through 42, and he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and began to pray, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Now, Jesus here was preparing for what we would say was the greatest act of humiliation. And you know, we talk about two aspects to the work of our Lord Jesus Christ, his, his humiliation or His humbling, He humbled Himself, and then His exaltation when He was exalted above every name that is named, above all power and authority. Well, this, He's preparing to go into the very depths of His humiliation. Now, His whole life from the time He came into the world was one continual act of humiliation or humbling. He had already humbled Himself when He came into this world as a man, remember, he is the eternal Son of God, and yet He became the creator of the world and the creator of all of us, became one of His creatures, which by itself is what we call an infinite stoop downward or an infinite humbling. When Jesus came into the world, He wasn't born into a rich family. He didn't live in a king's palace, as you might expect the Son of God to do enjoying all the pleasures that the world has to offer like Moses could have until he was called by the Lord to be the Messiah, as it were, for God's people to lead them out of Egypt. No, he, doesn't, he didn't enjoy those things. Instead, he was born into a poor carpenter's home, and he understood what it was like to work hard for a living. While he was here, this holy Lamb of God, the one who was spotless and blameless, the one who was high and exalted and separate from sinners, actually lived among sinful men, lived around people, the people of this world, having to put up with the sinful words they speak and the things they do, the backbiting, the bickering, and the mistreatment. Again, read the newspaper. Things were not different back in those days. Jesus was frequently hated and abused for telling others what God sent him to preach, that they needed to repent of their hatred and put their trust in him and begin to love each other as God commanded, as Jesus was loving them. That's his message, love. And they hated him for it. He was accused of blasphemy for claiming to be the Son of God, which is exactly what he was. That was all a part of his humbling, his humiliation. But now he was about to hand himself over to his enemies, to be arrested as a common criminal, to be put on trial and condemned, to be beaten, to be crucified, and then to die, to experience the consequences of sin, the separation of the soul from the body. And then, of course, his body would be laid in a tomb where it would stay for three days. This was all a part of his humiliation, and it's with these things in view that he began to pray. But there was one more thing in particular that concerned him more than any other, and it wasn't the mocking, it wasn't the beating, or even the crucifixion, though we have to recognize that those things in and of themselves would be very difficult and excruciatingly painful to go through. Jesus was looking at something that was going to be even more painful. And that was his father's wrath that was going to be poured out upon him on the cross. He was going to descend, as it were, into hell on the cross, taking his father's just punishment for the sins of his people, the wrath that was meant for our sins. Now, again, we could pause here and think about the fact that Jesus did not die for sins indiscriminately. 
Not the sins of the whole world, the sins of each and every individual, but from people from all around the world, from, for everybody who would put their trust in Him, those sins were laid upon Jesus, and even if just one sin had been laid upon Him, even that one sin would have been, well, would have made Jesus do what He did here, which, as we're going to see in a moment, was sweat blood, but there were many sins laid upon Jesus. I mean, just think about the number of sins that you have personally committed. I think about the number of sins that I have personally committed. That was plenty to make the wrath of God severe upon Jesus Christ. So with that in view, Jesus prays. And notice the first thing He prays, Father, if You are willing, remove this cup from Me. Well, what is the cup? It's the cup of His wrath, the cup which He had to drink, the curse that was meant for us and our sins. Jesus had to drink it. He had to drink it all down. But He says, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup. So what is Jesus praying here? Now, Jesus wasn't asking that the Father might suddenly abort the plan of salvation, come down and rescue His Son out of that situation and save Him from all the suffering He was about to endure. But Jesus was praying, Father, if you can accomplish your will in some other way, that you might do it in that way. And this is simply to say that Jesus was human. Jesus did not enjoy pain. I mean, would you want to go to the cross? Would you want to endure what Jesus was going to endure? And if you knew what it was like to endure the wrath of God, which would have destroyed us on the cross, but not Jesus because He is God in human flesh, wouldn't you pray, if it's possible, let it come some other way? Now, notice at the same time, while Jesus prays this, that He was still fully resigned, fully given to do His Father's will, because He follows that up with this statement in verse 42, yet not my will, but yours be done. And He says elsewhere, if this cup cannot pass unless I drink it, then let it be done as you have planned, not as I will but as you will. Now again, we need to recognize here Jesus was not making a sinful request. Jesus never sinned. He was simply expressing the desire of His human nature not to suffer, and that's not sin, not to want to go through this pain. Now Jesus would not have asked His Father this if He didn't think that it was somehow possible. Some, you know, He he thought, He must have thought, really that it was possible that there might be another way. Now, I bring that up simply to say that, or to remind us that Jesus was a man. He was fully a man. Yes, the person who was in that human nature was divine, but he was fully and completely a man. And as a man, he did not have infinite and unlimited knowledge. There were certain things that Jesus did not know, such as the day and the hour of His coming in judgment against Jerusalem for their crucifixion of Him. Jesus said that day and that hour no one knows, not the Son, not the angels, but the Father only. So Jesus had some limitation to His knowledge in His human nature, which is why He asked the question, if it's possible. But as He continued to pray, it became evident, perhaps more evident to Him, that there was no other way. And so as he continued to wrestle with his will to survive, that he might give up his life in this way, the Father sent him some support to help him to overcome that, as it were, that that human desire to, uh, to survive and to give him the strength to move forward. We read in Luke 22, verse 43, Now an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. And with this added strength, Jesus continues to pray. But I want you to notice this, that as He prayed, His prayers became more and more intense. Now He has a greater strength to be able to do this and to seek the Lord for this mercy. And so He continues to look forward into what it is that He must face in order to save us. And that is, as Jonathan Edwards put it, the fiery furnace of His Father's wrath. Basically, He was looking into hell itself. Hell, by the way, is is more than just a place. 
It is a place that exists. It is a place the Bible tells us is full of fire, which is why the imagery here, the fiery furnace. As a matter of fact, that furnace that, uh, again, Nebuchadnezzar's furnace that he, he lit up was somewhat of a picture of that. But hell is more than just a place. Hell is actually a place where God pours out His wrath. Many Christians today, many churches today characterize hell as a place where God is absent. But that couldn't be further from the truth. Hell is a place where God is present. But He is present in His fury and in His wrath and in His justice to punish sinners for their sin. The curse is on them and He punishes them. And I say that simply to say that Jesus did not have to descend anywhere or go anywhere to suffer hell. All He had to do was take His Father's wrath wherever He was on the cross. And that was a descent into hell. Now in this, he experienced as he was looking forward into this furnace and as he was praying, asking for the strength to be able to endure it. He experienced something that one only experiences under the greatest duress, and that is he began to sweat blood. Luke tells us in verse 44, and being in agony, he was praying very fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. Now again, I told you that Luke is, this is Luke's gospel. Luke was known as the beloved physician. That was his vocation uh, in, in life. He was somebody who was a doctor, and he gives to us here a doctor's description of what Jesus was going through. And he basically tells us in the original that Jesus sweat was mingled with blood. Literally, he says, it was like thick, clotted blood that was sweating and falling like drops to the ground. Now, some believe that this is where the atonement actually begins. Remember, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Well, Jesus here begins to shed blood in the garden as he's wrestled, as he's basically wrestling in this bloody sweat for the strength to follow through with His mission, to go to the cross to save our souls, perhaps the atonement had already begun. Certainly it was a part of Christ's work in His humiliation to bring us, to reconcile us to God. So, well, here we see then the, uh, the content of their prayers, what it is the disciples were supposed to be praying for, that they not enter into temptation and what it is that Jesus actually was praying for and the intensity with which He prayed for the strength to be able to go through hell on the cross so that we would not have to. Well, finally, we see the results of their prayers. What was the result in Jesus' case? Well, Jesus found the strength that He needed. He remained in the garden, as we're going to see uh, basically this evening, until the soldiers came and he handed himself over to them. He allowed himself to be arrested and he makes it quite clear in John chapter 18 that this was a decision on Jesus' part to give himself into their hands. They didn't take him against his will. They never could. And Jesus demonstrated in many different ways that he was doing this because this is what he wanted to do. He allowed himself to be arrested. He had, again, the strength to do this, to be condemned, to be beaten, to be crucified, and he endured his father's wrath on the cross. He died. He was buried. He rose again the third day. And as you know, he ascended into heaven and has been placed at that place of honor above all power and authority in heaven and on earth. Jesus found the strength to go through this. And having found the strength also in prayer, he went to his disciples immediately to encourage them to keep seeking the Father so that they too would be able to find the strength they needed to overcome the temptations they were about to face. Luke writes in verses 45 and 46, when he arose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping from sorrow and said to them, why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you may not enter into temptation. So Jesus prayed, and the Father heard him and answered his prayer. But what about the disciples? What about their prayers? What about the answer to their prayers? 
Well, the disciples didn't find that strength. When Jesus was arrested, they all forsook Him, fulfilling the Scripture that said in Mark 14, verse 27, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Peter, when he was confronted by a servant girl, and I think on two of those occasions and another bystander, denied three times that he even knew who Jesus was. And after Jesus was crucified, they all hid for fear of their lives. Now, we need to ask this question. You know, Jesus went into the garden. He prayed. He found the strength that He needed. What happened to the disciples? Why didn't they find the strength? Well, what were they doing in the garden while Jesus was agonizing in prayer? Jesus said when He came to them, they were sleeping. Actually, Luke, Luke records that. They weren't praying as their example had been praying to the point where they began to sweat blood in their wrestling against sin. You know, the author to the Hebrews might have had this very event in mind, or he may have had the crucifixion in mind, when he wrote in chapter 12, verses 3 and 4. For, and this, again, is a reason why we should set, lay aside every sin that entangles us and run the race. He says, For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. Now, the Bible says, if you seek the Lord, He will let you find Him. But He tells us in Deuteronomy 4, verse 29, it has to be in a very particular way. If you seek Him with all your heart and with all your soul, you see, that's what Jesus did. If you don't seek Him in this way, you're really not going to find Him. You must really want to find the Lord and His mercy when you seek Him in prayer. So Jesus prayed, and the Father heard Him and answered His prayer. The disciples, well, they slept. Jesus told them to pray, but they didn't pray. And when the time came, they could not resist the temptation. They fell right into it. If you want to resist temptation, you must pray. Now, in closing, let me just draw your attention to three things, first and just briefly. First of all, let me draw your attention to the love that Jesus has for you. If you have taken Him to be your Savior, if you have taken Him to be your Lord, Jesus went willingly to the cross for you, not just to die on the cross, but to take your place in hell so that you would not have to spend an eternity in hell, but that you would be able to spend an eternity with Him in heaven. Now, it wasn't easy for Jesus to do this. Sometimes I think we think it's easy. I mean, Jesus was God in human flesh after all. What kind of a challenge would this be for God in human flesh? Well, Look at the challenge that it was for Jesus. He prayed to the point where he sweat blood in order to go through with this, just looking forward to what it is he was going to have to go through. How much worse do you think it was when he actually went through it? And yet, he was willing to do this for you because that is how much he loves you. And that is what the table should remind all of us of. Every single Lord's Day when we come to the table, this reminds us of the love of Jesus Christ. Don't think about just the cross when you look at this. Don't think about just the breaking of His body and the shedding of His blood. Think about hell. Jesus suffered hell on the cross. And if you have trusted Him now, you will not have to suffer that for an eternity. If you have turned from your sins and trusted Him, you are safe. But again, the Father's love in giving His Son, the Son's love in laying down His life... That, Paul says, is something we're, we're, we're going to, it's going to take an eternity to understand just how high and how broad and how deep the love of Christ is, that He would be willing to do that for us, and that while we were still His enemies. We weren't His friends when He did this. We were still His enemies. God sent His Son into the world while we were still His enemies, and now that we are His friends, how much more will He keep us? now that He has given that which is most precious to Him, 
for our salvation. Now, if He did this for us, how much more should we love Him in return? I mean, Jesus is worthy. And if the infinitely worthy one laid down His life for those who were infinitely unworthy to save them, how much more should the infinitely unworthy ones lay down their lives to serve the one who is infinitely worthy? We should have done that anyway. You see, that's what our being created by Him binds us to to begin with. But how much more when He saves us from the consequences of our sins and shows us such great love. Well, secondly, we see where it is that Jesus found the strength to face that hell for us. He found it in prayer. Again, I'll draw your attention to the fact that it wasn't an easy thing for Jesus to do. He had to wrestle with His desire to live. He had to seek the Father with all of His heart and with all of His soul, and that's what He did. And Jesus found Him. That is where strength is found, the power to do what God's will is. And that brings us to the final point. Consider what it is that the Lord Jesus calls you and me to do in love, to put our comforts aside, to put our lives on the line, to tell other people about what it is that Jesus has to offer them, a, a free gift, eternal life. Now, we all know it's a little bit more complicated than that. It, it does sometimes, you know, it's, it's daunting sometimes because of the reactions we get. So where are we going to find the strength to be able to overcome our desire for self-preservation, our desire to remain comfortable and really to have life the way we would like it to have and just kind of enjoy it, enjoy the things we like to do? Where are we going to find the strength to lay aside those comforts, to get out of the comfort zone? And to obey the command that the Lord has laid upon us, which is really more than just a command, it is a great privilege to be His ambassadors with the message of life that could spare someone from hell forever and bring them into heaven. Where are we going to find the strength to do that? Well, the only place that we're going to find it is, at, is the same place where Jesus found it. And that is at the throne of grace. The reason why Jesus laid down His life and went through what he went through was to open that door for us so that we could come through and find that same strength and that same grace from his Father as we seek him for these things. If you seek the Lord for his mercy, if you pray with all your heart and soul, he will give you the grace that you need to do this for him. But again, if you don't seek him, don't expect to find the strength to be able to reach out for him. That's where it begins. It begins with prayer. We need to seek the Lord. It actually begins with salvation. Make sure you're trusting the Lord first. But if you are trusting Him, pray. But let me just say one more thing. When you're done praying, don't just get up and go back into the comfort zone. You have to then do what it is the Lord calls you to do. It's not enough to pray. It's not enough to desire to want to do what the Lord wants you to do or to agree it's a good thing that, that the Lord wants us to do and to agree that your neighbor does need to hear the gospel. You actually need to take it to him and share it with him. That's what the Lord wants you and me to do. So let's, let's bear those things in mind as we come to the table to remember what it is that Jesus did so that we would be able to do what He actually calls us to do. He went through hell so that we would have the grace we need to believe and to obey and to have that resource open to us that we can continually come to, to the Father in prayer to gain that grace and strength. Now, as we come to the table, let me also remind you that the table is for God's people. We have to trust in Jesus before we come to the table. We have to be willing to repent of our sins. If we come to the table and we don't belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, or if we are served and we participate in the table and we don't, the Bible says we're simply increasing our judgment. We're bringing more of God's curse down upon us for our hypocrisy. But if we do belong to Him, we are trusting Him, and we are repenting, even though we're not perfect. The Lord wants us to come. He wants us to remember Him, His love. He wants us to look to Him in faith, 
and to receive from Him what it is He has to give us, more of His Holy Spirit, and by faith actually receive that so that we will have more strength and more power to do what it is He calls us to do. The more we have of God's Holy Spirit, the more we're going to see the reality of these things, the importance of these things, even the beauty of these things, and the more we will give ourselves to it. So we need more of God's Holy Spirit, and this is one of the ways He gives us more of His Holy Spirit. What we've just heard is one of the ways He gives us more of His Holy Spirit. What we've just prayed is one of the things that, you know, one of the ways He gives us more of the Spirit. We need more of the Spirit of God to do what He calls us to do. So let's bow in just a moment of prayer, and let's prepare ourselves individually to either come or not come to the table, as the case may be. And let's also pray that if we are coming, that the Lord would prepare us to receive what He has to give us.